Dobrý den, vážené dámy, vážení dámy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camilla Biddle and I would like to welcome you to this meeting on behalf of the Association Migraine Help and uh, together with European Migraine Headache. Uh, Alliance welcome you at this workshop. The workshop is held under the auspices of Dr. Uh, Roman Kraus, Senate Health Care Committee. Unfortunately, due to an extraordinary Senate meeting, he will not be able to be here with us today. Uh, our seminar can be held uh, thanks to the kind support of uh, our partners uh, and uh, the event center, Sněmovní uh, Sedn. And migraine is a topic that uh, we not only deal with as professionals, but also as patients. And although this is one of the most frequent neurological disorders, it's often underestimated and uh, often it is a taboo to talk about, really. I would like to introduce uh, our panelists for the morning, Madam Riza Blazewska, the founder and head of a patient organization, Migrena Help. She studied social uh, pedagogy at uh, the Charles University, and she founded and is the head of the first patient organization supporting um, people suffering from migraine. She herself is a migraine sufferer. She has been suffering from migraine for uh, 10 years already. She was uh, 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 recognized as an invisible hero of the Czech healthcare uh, we also have Madame Elena Ruiz de la Torre, one of the uh, premium advocates of migraine patients in Europe and globally. She is the head of the European Migraine and Headache Alliance, an NGO representing 33 organizations supporting people suffering from different kinds of headaches all over Europe. Furthermore, we have Dr. Tomáš Nežádal, the, who is uh, the head of the Czech Headache Society, and uh, he's a member of the Czech Neurological Society in Prague and uh, uh, works at the Neurological Department of the Military University Hospital Střešovice in Prague. He speaks at congresses in the Czech Republic and Brought, and he authored numerous uh, articles and monographies. He's a member of the Czech Neurological Society of uh, the Czech Neurological Society of Jan Evangelista Purkinje, member of the Czech Society for Neural Physiology and the Czech Society Anti-Epileptic Society. Good morning. I also welcome Madam Jolena Markova. She is a neurologist and for many years she has been specializing in treating migraine. She's the head physician of the Center for Diagnosing and Headaches of the Neurological Clinic of the Third uh, Medical School of the Charles University and of Tomayer Teaching Hospital in Prague. She's also a secretary of the Czech Headache Society and a member of the International Headache Society. Good morning. And we also have Mr. Tom, uh, Dr. Tomáš Doležal with us, who is engaged in clinical research, economy, and technologies in medicine. He's a founder of AHETA Institute. Uh, Institute for Healthcare Economy and Technology Assessment, the organization support research, education, and building awareness concerning economy, healthcare, pharmacoeconomy, and uh, service results of medical care. 
welcome. And I would like to ask Riza for her introductory address. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. One more time with a microphone now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm uh, very happy to meet you here. I would also like to thank to all of those who have uh, supported this event, uh, especially the European Migraine and Headache Alliance. This is the first time when we're working on a project as large as this one, and I'm very happy and grateful for this. I also want to thank to the Czech uh, um, Headache uh, Society for their kind cooperation on this project, and I would like to ask, uh, um, uh, like to thank the agency CAC for um, supporting this project and to all the sponsors of the event. I am uh, really happy that. Uh, uh, this project can help uh, make uh, accessibility of migraine treatment in the uh, Czech Republic better. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will have some recommendations coming out from our discussion today. And perhaps we will have some next steps that we'll be able to make to make the life of migraine patients in the Czech Republic easier. In uh, enjoy enjoy the uh, seminar thank you now I would like to ask Elena Dobré ráno. Doufám, že to říkám správně. Děkuji za pozvání, Rizo. A skutečně chci Rize poděkovat, protože dělo odvádí spoustu práce pro pacienty s migrénou. Nemáte tušení, jak obtížné to je. Chtěla bych také poděkovat všem odborníkům, kteří tu jsou se mnou. Možná to nevíte, ale specializace na migrénu je v podstatě nejobtížnější neurologická specializace, protože pokud chcete léčit nás, pacienty s migrénou, tak to je velice obtížné. Vidíte nás jednou a pak nás už vydáte po zbytek života, protože migréna je velice obtížná na léčbu a také zákeřná a za to vám chci poděkovat. We did a study uh, on uh, the, uh, the naši studii uh, jsme and, um, in nine v rámci Europe, celé Evro uh, evropskou studii v rámci devíti uh, zemí. Měli jsme přes tři tisíce respondentů a musím poděkovat pacientským organizacím. Byli to tedy již uh, pacienti, kteří znali migrénu, věděli, uh, v čem spočívá a dostalo se jim, dostalo se jim léčby. Okay. Děkujeme, děkujeme, Eleno. A teďka bych... Uh, Thank you for the brief introduction. And now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Hoferek to um, show us the video with the greetings uh, from Madame Dlabajová, who was not able to attend due to uh, work assignments today. Good morning and greetings from the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Uh, we have a plenary, we are in a plenary session this week and that's why I cannot be here with you today. I would like to thank to the European Migraine and Headache Alliance uh, colleague for making the life of millions of Czechs and Europeans easier. And I would also like to thank them for asking me to making this short video from you and being with you uh, here. Uh, this topic is really important for me. Some time ago, it was really impossible to say the word migraine out loud. I have been a migraine sufferer for years, and I've always been alone. I am not anymore. I have always understood that migraine and the life with migraine is difficult for me and for my close 
first ones. I have realized that speaking about migraine openly and frankly is not a sign of weakness. On the other hand, I realized that speaking about this chronic disease is important part of working and living with migraine. And although this may seem to be very difficult, uh, because we have to learn how to rely on ourselves and many people feel stigmatized and lonely with their migraine. We have to learn not to fear to share our stories. That's why this uh, conference is so important and I'm really grateful to the patient organization to be engaged in this so much in building awareness of migraine and this stigmatizing migraine and helping us move forward. We're moving forward also thanks to the uh, fact that uh, the, the early diagnostics and treatment of migraine is being discussed more and more nowadays. People with migraine need enough information about their disease and enough information about how to tackle it. The, there's plenty of information. They are easy to reach. We just have to speak about it. And there are millions of us uh, who suffer from migraine in the European Parliament. I have many colleagues who are also migraine sufferers. And since we talk about it out loud, there's even a working group in the European Parliament discussing the topic and uh, building awareness of the topic at the healthcare committees in the parliament. I wish all of us who suffer from migraine a lot of strength to face it, be bold, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. And we have one more video. Okay, uh, the video will come a little later. Uh, now it's time for the presentations. And I would like to ask Dr. Tomáš Nežádal for his presentation. Tak já, já se omlouvám, já budu stát takhle, takhle bokem, abych viděl na svoji prezentaci a Aha. pokusím se I a fialece. Uh, we'll skip the first uh, slides of the presentation. Good morning. I have to say that migraine is really a very frequent disease. Um, there are 17 percent of uh, women and uh, five over five percent of men suffer from migraine and is the second most uh, disabilitating diagnosis uh, in young women globally because because uh, people suffering from migraine are incapacitated, really. If you're on a wheelchair, you can still work. If you uh, are going through a migraine attack, you cannot do anything. There are millions of people. Um, uh, there's overall, globally, there is one billion people suffering from uh, migraine. And they spent 4.2 million uh, years with some kind of disability. So the impact of migraine is really huge globally. Uh, Global Barden article um, estimated that in the Czech Republic there's some 1.72 uh, million uh, people suffering from migraine, which uh, translates to 81.41 thousands of uh, um, uh, years lived with disability. And um, uh, up to 1% of the population suffers from chronic migraine. And um, uh, related to this is medication overuse headache, uh, which comes when um, uh, patients overuse, uh, overuse drugs to treat their migraine. In Czech Republic, this would be some 70,000 people 
who are hidden somewhere. We do not see them yet. The prevalence of migraine reaches its peak in productive age. And according to the graph, we can see that the peak is somewhere between 35, 40 years. So it basically affects the most productive part of the population. The quality of life with migraine um, is affected in many aspects. Up to 30 uh, percent uh, patients uh, had their career affected by migraine. 23 percent fear loss of job because they have frequent absences due to migraine. Up to 40 percent uh, respondents said that migraine has affected um, their parenthood relationship with the children. On the other hand, how Teenagers see the migraine of their parents. Eight, around 10% of these children have been affected by their parents' migraine, and their study results have been affected. Partnership, almost 40% patients said that they would be better partners if they had no headaches. And family planning, 3% of respondents decided not to start a family because of uh, recurring headaches. We have 2011, 2012 uh, uh, data before the new treatment came, and the costs were uh, some um, 1,200,000 euros per year per person to treat migraine. Most of these costs are indirect costs, and they are really difficult to calculate. There are different surveys, quality, life quality surveys, uh, uh, focusing on different areas, but it's really difficult to calculate this precisely. In Great Britain, this would be a loss of two million pounds. In the North, uh, in the North America, they calculated costs for three months, and the costs were some uh, three hundred and eighty uh, thousand million dollars for episodic migraine uh, while the chronic migraine was much more uh, cost uh, demanding it was around one thousand dollars I'm not going to talk about different stages of uh, migraine headache I will skip this uh, this medical part but we know that uh, um, uh, migraine therapy can be divided into acute and profit Philactic, and this is just a reminder of the previous treatments with the old-fashioned boxes. These are the combined analgetics uh, that are the most frequent causes of uh, um, uh, medication overdose headaches because they are combined. They are combined with cocaine, etc. And the most frequent uh, traditional uh, treatment uh, includes non-steroid uh, um, uh, anti non-opioid analgetics, combined uh, analgetics that we don't like because uh, the headache becomes fre more frequent, ergotamine, which is no longer recommended. There is also a targeted therapy. The first targeted therapy um, uh, was by Treptan, selective antagonist of 5-HT1. BD slash F, and we also have new treatments, DITANS and GEPANS antagonists of the CGPR receptor. This is the modern treatment that's going to be available in here as well. There are some risks uh, of treating acute uh, migraine, uh, overuse headache, uh, renal, um, liver uh, uh, problems, uh, tryptans. This may lead, uh, um, some of the treatments may lead to some heart disorders. And there may also be um, problems caused by medication combinations. Uh, in case a patient spends more than four years uh, uh, per month with a headache, we use a prophylactic pharmacotherapy. Or in case patients have got really severe symptoms, auras, etc., uh, in that case, we will use this treatment uh, also in case uh, the patient's uh, headaches do not occur so frequently. In terms of the prophylactic uh, pharmacotherapy, we use a wide range of um, uh, medicines and in blind studies, 
um, that focused on many different aspects, neurological, internal, etc. Uh, we use anti-seizure uh, treatment, beta blockers, uh, 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 um, uh, and other uh, other uh, medications. The prophylactic treatment of migraine of course uh, carries some risks. We know that 98% of patients use acute medication to treat their migraine and about 45% patients visit their uh, doctor uh, because of migraine, but only some 30% of uh, patients use prophylactic treatment and after some uh, three months only. 30 uh, uh, less patients use it after six months, only 30 percent of patients use a prophylactic treatment. And here this graph shows uh, the uh, prophylactic pharmacotherapy. So we see that the conventional treatment is not really very efficient. Two thirds of patients. Uh, who uh, were prescribed prophylactic treatment uh, do not start using it at all, and 70% uh, drop out prophylactic treatment uh, within six months from starting. Fortunately, we have new prophylactic treatment uh, based on uh, pathogenic mechanisms, such as uh, uh, I'm referring to CGRP. There are large molecules, CGRP. CRPs and small molecules uh, which are not available in the market yet. Calcitonin gene-related peptide, CGRP, in short, uh, is a peptide that works in the migraine cascade. It has been subject to much re research since, since the 1990s, and after 30 years of research, it is finally available. Its efficacy has been proven. When CGRP was uh, applied intravenously, um, it worked, and sumatriptan uh, and uh, tetratriptan uh, did really um, lower the threshold of uh, this peptide. So this is a new method. Uh, we have four um, antigens uh, available in the Czech Republic. Uh, they started arriving uh, in 2020. Uh, Eptism WAP uh, is reimbursed from public health insurance. Um, Eptism WAP is humanized. Um, Antigen. Uh, the remaining three are fully human or all humanized. Two. Um, the, the drug is administered uh, after 10, uh, 20 days or uh, a month. Uh, and Episamubab is once in three months. So, uh, Contrary to the medication available before, people that where people had to take tablets every day, uh, with today's uh, medication, uh, it is enough to take it prophylactically once a month. Uh, the drugs were uh, tested in clinical trials. Uh, we showed some indicative criteria on the basis of uh, a recommendation from the European Society. In the Czech Republic, uh, uh, the indication criteria uh, is fairly patient-friendly, more than four migraine days a month uh, before uh, it is also proven that uh, one of the treatments available is an anti-epileptic uh, drug. So these are the prophylactic uh, uh, treatment uh, groups in the Czech Republic because it is um, uh, tied back to the uh, treatment centers, to the clinic, uh, as Dr. Markova will elaborate on later on. We have to have uh, the treatments fully documented. Uh, 
sometimes uh, the drugs are phased out before starting another in other in some other patients we use we leverage the effect of the uh, the gents and uh, then uh, there is a break after a year which happens um, for most patients because uh, most patients relapse. How is the treatment terminated? Uh, we look back at the efficacy, how the drug is working after three months. If uh, the criteria on the checklist are not fulfilled, uh, the treatment is deemed ineffective. When the effect is only partial, we may uh, add on top another form of treatment. We are uh, also talking about uh, antigen switch or swap when one antigen, when one um, um, ing uh, active ingredient fails, we should be free to swap it for another way. There is a, 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 a relationship to a receptor um, or the other alternative. Uh, contraindications are clear. Uh, pregnant women or women planning pregnancy are taken off the drug. Also, uh, other uh, serious diseases um, are contraindicative. The Czech American Society, Dr. Makova, will speak about uh, the antigens are in group one when the index increase was 20 to 21 percent, which kind of made room for further uh, escalation. Uh, also, uh, the, the number of suitable patients is around 23,000 in the Czech Republic, which is from the database of the Public Health Fund. But we know that uh, prophylaxis leaves a lot to be desired in the Czech Republic. Um, so we are, they are undermedicated, the patient population. But uh, we have about 25,000 patients altogether, patient pool. Uh, the centers, the clinics are in hospitals or outpatient clinics. Uh, uh, all the uh, outpatient clinics uh, have uh, contracts with Visa P, the largest health fund, uh, but their budgets are uh, for around 15 treated patients on average. Uh, budgets uh, they are different, low uh, and persistent. They are not increased. Uh, migraine and headache centers are uh, operating on a similar uh, in a similar way than the sclerosis treatment centers. Sclerosis treatment. Uh, we have uh, now 27 uh, centers out of 30s uh, with 936 patients enrolled in the network. But Dr. Dolezal will speak about that uh, a bit more later on. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, I uh, found a study with a company Zubab. Uh, they were uh, uh, they, the research focused on a chronic migraine as well as episodic migraine, migraine. Also, patients that where the episodic migraine medication failed to work, and and uh, the co indirect cost savings uh, were determined at around seven thousand dollar uh, mark uh, of saving. Uh, per year when uh, migraine is treated. So with that, I appeal for increasing uh, and raising awareness of uh, migraine as an issue among the general population, uh, highlighting the uh, prophylactic options uh, that they are available also uh, because uh, Treating uh, treating migraine after it happens is much more expensive. Uh, cost of infusion, cost of more expensive drugs, etc. Also, uh, furthermore, migraine is debilitating um, condition, uh, so it carries its uh, cost at the, uh, at this level as well. And we know how to treat migraine, so the awareness must be raised. Thank you, raised. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. The, popula uh, the presentation was very dense. Thank you very much. Very informative. Now Dr. Markova will step up and take the floor.
a aby jsme vás viděli potom and, na záznamu. And please Děkujeme. stand a bit more to this side so that we can see you on the recording. Good afternoon. Oh, morning still. Um, thank you for coming and I will uh, brief you on how treatment and uh, headache and migraine centers, uh, diagnostic and treatment centers are organized. So the deployment, uh, because the centers de decide on uh, the uh, uh, indication of the new biological treatments that are available. But uh, when a patient is re referred to the centers with, uh, with the note, uh, put him on CGRPs, it should not be happen automatically. The centers should reassess the, pa the patient and uh, uh, set the course of treatment themselves. Uh, certification is done by the Czech Neurological Society for a period of five years. And in addition to uh, the motive of having truly experienced doctors deciding on the course of treatment, uh, assessing the patient fully, uh, centers also um, afford a, a certain hub of um, equipment and expertise uh, and they work out to be more cost effective in our view. It is not uh, practiced everywhere in uh, in Europe, for instance, in Slovakia, in Germany. Uh, every neurologist following uh, after meeting certain criteria can indicate this treatment, prescribe this treatment biological treatment, but uh, uh, we, so, so the practice is different in uh, different countries. The network of uh, centers, in our view, is uh, sufficient uh, for the territory of the Czech Republic. All regions have a center. This is a map from 2019. Those nine centers were started working in 1990s when uh, triptanes became available. At the time, it was uh, the miracle treatment of uh, migraine attacks. And uh, some of us um, uh, became specialists in the migraine treatment and spent more time and um, looked more deeply at patients. Uh, at every center, it was one or two doctors. Uh, when the Biological treatment became, became available. The centers found a new role. They should care for these patients for biological treatments. We have 31 centers. I know, uh, we have three in Prague uh, and more or less in uh, every other region. We have uh, the biotreatment centers. There are also private clinics, uh, but they are contracted to the health funds. Uh, so the treatment is reimbursed based on a contract. So going back to my original slide, the limitation of uh, uh, the full effectiveness of the uh, network centers is the budget. Uh, so the budget is a clear this. Uh, restrictions. Some centers have waiting lists. Uh, the patient is indicated, but the center has uh, used up its allowance, its budget for the health uh, fund reimbursement, and the patient can be put on treatment only in the next year. So uh, this table shows how many patients uh, per center. Those are the different centers in the regions, but uh, there is a bias in these figures. Some centers, uh, for instance, clinical, have only three doctors, and they are open only three days a week uh, for headache patients. Some centers are open only one week, uh, one day a week, uh, because they only have one doctor. And uh, even though the figures may look a bit, uh, a bit desperate, it's, it's, the situation is not so bad uh, for, for the patients, I assure you. Uh, what are the general requirements for a specialist in the treatment of headache? Uh, 
uh, if he or she is prescribed biological treatment, uh, they must be uh, attested a neurologist. They must have long-standing uh, experience in headache migraine treatment. Uh, they must attend at least once a year some further education uh, events in the area of diagnostics and treatment. They uh, must uh, participate in the central BH activities. They must be uh, very well versed in the uh, indicative criteria of biological treatment. They must be competent. Uh, um, also on the prophylactic front, they must uh, publish or lecture in the discipline. The scope of uh, centers, central care, uh, basic diagnostics and differential diagnostics, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy in the whole scale of uh, migraine treatment, including episodic as well as chronic. Uh, they, the centre must uh, be uh, aware of the advantages of indicating various forms of treatments. Uh, these antibodies uh, are sometimes um, some antibodies are uh, dissolved in the uh, in the body, so they can be suitable for for certain type of patients with other co uh, on other treatments or comorbidities. And uh, we have some centers where the results were good, very good, because we had uh, we had to explain everything to the patients. And where we did, the results were good. Where the center didn't, uh, the, the results were not so bad. Now with the biological treatment, uh, this, the results are improving. And this is a certificate that we that all centers have. The Center for Diagnosis, Diagnosis and Treatment of Headaches, this is location, this is the um, expert in charge. Uh, uh, Reming uh, register is something that's going to be covered by my colleague in uh, a follow-up presentation. Now, patient journey. Uh, in uh, the Czech Republic, there is no gatekeeping. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, perhaps, not all patients know it. Uh, if they knew this fact, then centers would be overloaded. But uh, uh, I think most patients or a large part of patients uh, stick to the patient journey as follows. They uh, consult their doctors uh, who, if, if uh, at all versed in migraine and headache issues, uh, can uh, recommend uh, either a diagnostic test or triptanes because they work uh, for some types of aches and pains. And if the patient has a, a migraine uh, attack two, three times a month, so, uh, they are on sumatriptan. They take sumatriptan three times a month, then I think that's a, a satisfactory uh, medication. If uh, the case is serious, then the patient is advised to seek out uh, a neurologist consultation and take the issue up with them. Uh, other patients, uh, some neurologists are also uh, aware of prophylactic treatment options and indicate. Uh, such medication. And uh, if the problem is aggravated or uh, more persistent, then the patient is referred to a center uh, where they undergo a diagnosis. Uh, their previous treatment is assessed if they were put on the right medication in the right doses, dosages, etc. Uh, and the center reviews the number of migraine events and the medication. and. Following uh, the fulfillment of certain criteria, we may indicate the biological treatment to the patient. Our center does not have a waiting list, and if uh, the uh, patient meets uh, the, the criteria, uh, we prescribe biological treatment after the first consultation. But patients, they usually come 
unprepared. They do not uh, keep a diary or record of migraine incidents, and we do not have anything in hand to show to the health fund uh, that the patient uh, meets uh, the criteria for biological treatment indication. But then we work with the patient. We tell them what to keep, what to uh, what to write down. Then after three months, we usually have enough in hand to put them on this type of treatment. Uh, uh, sometimes doctors, neurologists, or GPs uh, dismiss are dismissive of patients with headache or migraines. You know, they say, "Well, I get headaches too." Or at this time, anybody gets headaches. Then, uh, obviously, that does not help the patient at all. Some neurologist offices indicate preventative treatment through tested medication. The patient arrives with a list of three uh, drugs that they have been tra uh, treatment, and uh, none of them is in the evidence-based category. That is very difficult to explain that to the patient when you don't do not want to undermine the authority of your colleagues. Uh, patient or sometimes buy, uh, buys out of pocket or over the counter combined analgetics and they are not aware of the side effects and they arrive for the consultation with the chronic migraines and medication or for use uh, symptoms and uh, some patients are, are so uh, bad in in, in, uh, in their suffering you know, from, the, from the condition they are uh, they request that they are referred to a center. Uh, centers have restriction of, of the budget, as we saw, and as may not be able to put them, uh, put the patient who is who is a, a, a severe migraine sufferer may not. Uh, be able, the center may not be able to put them on the biological treatment center away, uh, straight away. So sometimes the centers refer patients uh, where they, uh, between themselves to another center which still has some budget available. Uh, we There was a survey uh, of patients on triptate therapy. At, at, some of them uh, were on at least two prophylactics. And uh, this is the result in the Czech Republic. It was estimated in 2019, this was published, so prior, prior to that, in, uh, in the Czech Republic, there were 23,000 patients meeting the condition for indication of biological treatment. According to the statistics, uh, that did not, they were not denied treatment, but these patients did not even make it to, uh, to the doctor or to the center. Uh, this is another study we did. Um, the center doctors, the doctors working for the centers were surveyed. Uh, we asked them, uh, what are the restrictions that you see to your work, uh, what, what ties your hands, etc. Uh, how many patients uh, were denied treatment or could not be put on the treatment for which reasons, uh, Reasons? Uh, what are the waiting times, why, why the waiting times are so long, how many patients on the waiting list, how many patients had, have to be turned away. And what the doctors see as the biggest obstacles to CGRP indication, and uh, what you yourself, the doctor, uh, would welcome, would appreciate getting uh, to to make your work easier, you know, to to improve the conditions for your work. So it was a one-to-one uh, -one questionnaire uh, in. 2022, and out of uh, we sent uh, to send the questionnaire to it was a questionnaire form, a big pardon, and uh, out of the 30, 31 centers, 27 returned the questionnaire with answers. So the average capacity for CGRP is 170 patients. The median uh, median value is uh, 100 patients. And uh, the differences between centers are mainly due to how many doctors they have available. Now, is the 
uh, there was a question to the average uh, annual number of patients that could be put on anti-CGRP treatment. Uh, so the number is 103, the median is 50 patients. So somewhere between 20, uh, so under 20 patients a year, between 21 and 50 patients, between 51 and 100 patients, 101 and 200 patients, and uh, and more than 200 patients per year. I mean, there were some centers that were that were so optimistic that they could treat uh, 200 over 200 patients uh, a year if there were no constraints. I think that was the Brno Center. I believe they were quite optimistic in that regard. The most uh, frequent reads reason for not indicating anti-CGRP was uh, the failure to meet the indication criteria. Patients who are not on a therapy uh, long enough, or they were uh, they were not disciplined, uh, and also. So second to the failure to meet the indicative criteria, the centre did not have. A contract with the health fund of the patient uh, where the patient was registered. So the, where the, those were the two main re region reasons. For instance, one of our centers was uh, given a, a, a limit of five patients per year from one particular health fund. But I've heard that has improved. Uh, waiting time for consultation. Uh, here the results are quite satisfactory. Within two months, uh, most patients get to a consultant, uh, which is better compared to most of Europe. Uh, uh, but uh, staff shortages and center capacity were often cited as reason, reason. Some centers were uh, able to see patients within a month uh, from booking of an appointment between one and three months uh, was more commonplace because when uh, you, you see, when you consult with a new patient, it's much more, um, it requires much more time. It's much more time consuming. The most frequently cited restrictions were staffing restrictions, especially in small offices with the district hospitals when uh, the uh, head doctor tells uh, his colleague, you know, you're going to go to the center, uh, you're going to be seconded with the headache and migraine center, and, and, uh, but only for two afternoons a week. Sometimes neurologists are also not aware of anti-CGRP uh, drugs and CGRP efficacy, uh, CGRP research. So according to the doctors, uh, and uh, more doctors, more nurses would mean more time for patients with migraines. So we are appealing to the management of wards to give uh, more allowance time to to their doctors who work at the centres. So that, thank you very much and uh, thank you for your attention. That's all. Thank you, Pani Doktorko. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation and for the recommendations for patients. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Dolezal for his presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It has already been said that migraine is a chronic disease that mostly influences quality of life. And hand in hand with quality of life goes the ability to work, to enjoy leisure time activities. And it has already been said that uh, the socioeconomic uh, impacts should not only be uh, seen or examined in the healthcare uh, financing and costs, but also in the uh, from the perspective of uh, um, life and lifestyle uh, absences at uh, work, etc. Uh, there have been uh, some studies conducted in other countries concerning the socio-economic uh, impacts of migraine. However, they 
are really not transferable to other countries. So it's very important to collect data in a particular country. And thanks to our REMIC register, we have started collected this data and we will soon evaluate it. And we also cooperate with a patient organization that is directly in touch with patients. And hopefully we will get data for them by mid next year as well. I would like to mention a few recent studies from other countries and they clearly show that the impact on work life as well as leisure time of people suffering from migraine are really critical and we can see that the load actually increases with a number of days uh, migraine days of patients usually female patients and this affects the work productivity as well as uh, um, um, leisure time activity from the economic point of view we know that even the leisure time activity generates some value so if someone suffers from migraine out of work they cannot take care of their family uh, do the house chores many other things that uh, there are many other things that are affected and uh, that represent a loss that can be um, calculated. There could be a value uh, put to it. There was a study uh, conducted in Finland. You see the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. It's not the number of uh, migraine seizures. It's the number of therapies. So the patients with the zero have no prophylax uh, prophylaxis. One, two, three represent the uh, medicines uh, or uh, pharmaceuticals. And we see uh, the increase of uh, days out of work, um, doctor visits, and the more severe the migraine is, the severe the impact on life, the more the life of a person is impaired. And this is not correlated to the uh, success of the therapy, because we expect that with successful therapy, the numbers would decrease. With uh, In our REMIC register, we have hoped to have uh, data for the patients. Uh, but before the start of the therapy, interim data and then final data at the end of the therapy after 12 years and this is also unique about our, our register because we plan to monitor our patients from before they uh, get onto the treatment all the way up to the, uh, to when they finish their treatment. There was a similar uh, extensive study contacted, uh, conducted in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. They um, examined uh, the loss of work productivity. And here we can see the, sorry, it was Lithuania and Latvia. And we know that the, these countries' uh, populations are not very huge. But the blue, uh, blue bar shows the impact on uh, the Economy and but the, the the absolute value is not as important as the ratio we can see in here. We know that these uh, impacts represent like one third of all the all the health uh, impacts. So if you um, recalculate this to all the other aspects like socio-economical aspects, etc. And this is not because people just drop out of the labor market because they, they do not stop working, but their work capacity is limited. Uh, they have more absences at work and also uh, their labor productivity may be impaired at work. So uh, they may actually work on certain days, but their work productivity may be limited by 30, 30 percent compared to regular work productivity. And this is a number from some other studies. So we are really able to calculate these impacts. And I'm looking forward to seeing the outcomes of our uh, study using the REMIC register. Um, one check study tried to ascertain the epidemiological situation in the Czech Republic based on data from an insurance company. And they were looking at the prevalence at the number of diagnoses and treatments that were reported. 
and the result was 1%. And this basically reflects how many patients are really out of the system in the Czech Republic. So there are dozens of percent, hundreds of thousands of people that were not uh, that were not taken into consideration at the time when this, when this uh, study was done. This is slowly changing, of course, because um, uh, awareness about migraine is uh, being uh, uh, developed. But in the past, people did not really uh, know about the possible treatment. These are numbers from Finland, and we see that 7.4% women and 2.1% men uh, were identified as having diagnosis of migraine. And from the socioeconomic perspective, this is really a massive uh, number. Uh, so we, we can speak of um, economy of migraine, which is really a burden on the entire society. And for the first time, I can show you the results uh, that uh, we got um, uh, with the data from the REMIC register. And I would like to say thank you to Dr. Nejadal, because I know that there have been many moments when we were not quite sure that the REMIC register would uh, really come to existence. But hopefully, we have uh, some numbers now, some data. And hopefully, the register will start generating data not only for uh, physicians and patients, but also for health insurance companies and the uh, state uh, drug uh, agency, because I'm sure there will be discussions uh, concerning uh, extending uh, the possible treatment. And we know that compared to uh, the rest of Europe, even the, um, the Western Europe, the treatment of migraine is uh, quite good and accessible in the Czech Republic. We just have to think about the conditions uh, to access the new treatment and the uh, budgets for the new treatment. So uh, in 2021, we had uh, just a few patients uh, in the register. In 2022, we have over 900, almost 1,000 patients in the register now. Uh, the data is scarce so far, but hopefully soon we will be able to present um, annual or one one year data for almost 1,000 patients. 27 centers are participating in the register. And the structure of the data contains basic and personal information like age, uh, the uh, time or the date when the diagnosis was made, uh, previous treatment, how the patient was uh, treated before, what was the prophylaxis, what's the patient's acute medication. And we also monitor the effects and efficacy of the biological uh, treatment to be able to document uh, its efficacy. Um, and I am happy that we really managed to put a lot of uh, uh, focus on the preparation of the patient service. So we're also collecting information concerning quality of light, labor productivity. Um, we have questions concerning how their lives are affected. We also ha uh, monitor uh, the efficacy of the treatment. And we did similar studies for other diagnoses in the past. And I believe that this study will also be very interesting once it's uh, finalized. Demographic uh, data, 88% uh, um, uh, of patients in the register are women, average age 40. 6.6 years, uh, the most frequent group 40 to 49 years, and uh, usually uh, the patients are diagnosed at around 20 years of age, and uh, the average uh, time that elapses from diagnosis to treatment is so that people have to live with the diagnosis is some 27 years. We see that most of these people really work full time. They are either employed or they are self-employed. Um, they are just single digit 
percent of people who cannot work. Uh, the migraine is not very frequent in the senior population. And this is important because we um, uh, also analyze data from the VEMUS uh, um, register uh, monitoring patients with multiple sclerosis. And we see that thanks to biological, modern biological treatment, the work productivity of uh, patients suffering from multiple uh, sclerosis does not really decline uh, dramatically. There's some decline, but it's not very um, uh, dramatic. So the patients on uh, biological treatment are really able to maintain their jobs and not be disqualified on the labor market because of their diagnosis. So hopefully we will see similar results with the biological treatment uh, for migraine as well. Of course, we cannot bet on this, but uh, we will see. And uh, here you can see that the data is really very new. We have 991 patients in the register. These are the months uh, for which we've been monitoring the patients. Uh, we have had uh, 300 patients in the register for 12 months, 800 uh, for six months. And of course, um, uh, the longer the register exists, the more data we will have. And the long-term data is, of course, the most interesting one, because you cannot get the really long-term data from clinical studies. Uh, it will also be interesting to see data concerning um, deployment of new treatment, uh, ending of the treatment, etc. Now, how the treatment is deployed. So the regular number of uh, days um, with uh, of the monthly migraine days is some 12, uh, 12 days per month. So you see that the treatment is provided to the patients with the most serious uh, migraine cases. Um, after three months of treatment, the number of their monthly migraine days uh, declined to some 4.5 per month. Then uh, further, uh, uh, we do not see such a dramatic uh, decrease. But after a year of treatment, uh, on average, the monthly migraine days decreased, decreased to some three days of migraine per month. So we see that the uh, that the effect of the treatment is uh, quite considerable, and we also uh, monitor the concomitant and acute uh, treatment. It is interesting to see that while in most patients, the deployment or administration of uh, biological treatment does not really um, uh, treat uh, the migraine entirely, you can you can see though that some 15 percent may uh, drop the acute uh, treatment not need it uh, afterwards uh, the rest of the patients still may need some acute treatment while on biological treatment as well. But the number of days when they need the acute treatment is really declining. And we can see in some cases it's more than 50% declines, which is a huge progress. And patients also do not have to use the other types of analgetics either. And uh, it is no surprise that the treatment is very safe. There's really minimum of uh, undesirable side effects. Some patients uh, may drop out of the therapy. Out of the over 900, some 39 patients have dropped out because the uh, treatment was not helping them. In some cases, they, uh, the ladies became pregnant. Uh, but we can see that the, this treatment is uh, really very safe. But we had already known this from the previous studies. And thanks to the register, we're able to uh, get really unique data, not only in the Czech, but uh, in the European context. So we can see uh, that there's really not much data how the 
treatments are progressing and I'm looking forward to re receiving even more data and more inputs from the uh, professional uh, physicians associations. Uh, but uh, it is clear that this treatment is uh, efficient, safe, reduces the number of uh, migraine days for the patients, and it is very likely that it will also have a positive effect on the quality of life, work pr productivity, labor productivity, and uh, this is uh, something that we will evaluate during the follow-up uh, at the end of the year for the three or 400 patients that we will have in the register for 12 months by then. And uh, the potential is really much bigger than originally thought. And the uh, uh, study that I'm referring to now uh, was conducted before the new treatment became available and we took into consideration patients uh, that uh, had some previous treatment uh, but now two years after the uh, biological treatment uh, is being deployed the number may even double and uh, the study uh, we conducted in 2020 indicated that many people cannot really or were not able to find any help within the healthcare system. So here I would like to appeal especially to general practitioners to not to discourage the patients from seeking more professional and specialized help because uh, self-treatment may not always be most efficient. So they should not really rely rely on uh, over-the-counter analgetics. And this data here were collected in the years 2012-2016, which is really very much into the history. Uh, so it would be really interesting to see data, the current data for the years 2021-2022, data for the next year, and compare it. Perhaps we will see change in the treatment of migraine paper. The study, the Finnish study that uh, I mentioned also indicated uh, uh, a considerable change and uh, the, the healthcare companies obviously were able to uh, support more patients uh, in, in Finland thanks to their system. So hopefully we will manage to catch up and support more migraine patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for slightly different view of migraine and the entire topic and now the video I promised at the beginning. Thank you. So we've 
just reminded ourselves how 80 seconds of waiting may be unpleasant. And now I would like to ask Madam Elena to present the European study, and then I will ask Risa to speak about the study conducted in the Czech Republic. And after we're done, I will ask all the panelists to come back. I'm going to only to highlight the most, the most important things that came out from this study, because the study was a huge one with, as I said before, 3,000, uh, let me learn now, 3,900 3, uh, responders. And we wanted to know it was conducted with, um, let me see. It was conducted together with uh, KPMG because we wanted to do a real professional one and, um, in, in not so many countries. Just to highlight the problem and the, bar the real burden of at this moment of the patients uh, that already know that they have migraine, they are aware because, and they are expert because they are through the patient organization, what was the best, uh, their, their situation. The okay. Then, things in my hands now. <laughs> I always say that the best and most innovative treatment is useless if there is no access to it. And that's what it is happening. There has been a huge amount of money invested in research for this new, new treatment and we are not having uh, enough access to it. Is that because it is expensive or is that because it is for migraine? Just for migraine. We have done a huge evolution in the last 20 years in the, in the field of the science. We have done a huge evolution. We have gone up. But we haven't done any evolution about the perception of migrant for the society and the policymakers and the payers and the controllers. And we need to change that mind. We are already on the 21st century. This is a neuro normal neurological condition disease and we need to be treated as all the others, as all the rest. No? No, here. So one third of the responders had to visit at least or between four and eight specialists to get an appropriate diagnosis and treatment. That means that they have been going for eight years around waiting to find a good doctor, a good specialist. Is it maybe that there is not enough specialists? Is it maybe that we need still more education on GPs? We, are, we as patients, we know what, uh, what, what we listen when we go to a GP. We hear them saying, well, this is a normal condition when they diagnose it as migraine and they say this is a normal condition, don't worry, you, will, you need to get used to it. We will treat you with this, that, 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 but this is normal. So get used to it. And although 90% of the, of the responders were, of, were treated, remember that those are the expert ones that they know already about migraine and they are around the patient organizations, time to, to the diagnosis is very, very high. And um, we have, we have here graphics by countries to compare countries. In some countries, it is much, much higher than in others. But it goes from three years till, till eight in Spain. I'm Spanish, that's why I say that in this, with that uh, thing. And then, the, since the diagnosis, the first treatment that they receive, it's generally analgesics. This is, now I have a light, no? If we go here, if we go here, we see that this, the first time they go, the patients go to a doctor, they receive mostly analgesics. This is only the CGRP therapy. The second time, there is a little bit more of CGRP therapy, and then they start with specific prescriptions, such as triptans or things like this. The third uh, option is preventive treatment here. We have less of acute treatment and, and less of analgesics, still CGRP therapy is very low. The same than in the fourth visit, fifth visit, 
six, vi six visits, and then in the, uh, you have to get to the seventh visit. Uh, you have to understand that between one visit and another visit, it's six time, six months time. It's a, or, or um, sometimes even a year. So it takes a long time to get to the right treatment, which is the, the seventh one. In the meanwhile, in all this meanwhile, we have been treated mostly with preventive treatments or other treatments, and I am a patient. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a specialist, I'm a lawyer, but I am here defending the voice of the patients. So I'm sorry for what I'm going to say, but we have been poisoned between semicolons with so many other treatments that were not researched for migraine. They are used for migraine, it, they work for migraine sometimes, but they were not used for migraine. Now there is a problem with migraine overuse headache, there's a problem with overuse medication. We don't understand what's going on, we don't understand what the overuse and the chronification is rising up, but we have a lot to do in looking after the side effects of those uh, treatments that we have been taking for, those, for so many years. Then the majority of those who do not take the anti-CGRP, as you were saying before, report that they don't, uh, they, haven't, they don't take it because their doctor didn't mention it in the 26%, because it's not covered by their healthcare system in the 25%, or they are not eligible for a treatment yet, that's what they are told, uh, in the 25%, or the, it is not even available in their country yet. I tell you that we really need it to cope with a normal life. For those patients treated with new CGRP therapy, 25% reported to pay their treatment out of their pocket. It looks like the healthcare system is not giving enough budget to the migraine and to those CGRP therapies because it's very expensive. If it is expensive for the healthcare system, what happens with the patient pocket? Is it not expensive for one patient's pocket? And we have to look and look for one and beg, and in many cases I have to tell you that we have to beg to get one of those new uh, CGRP. We really know the patients, how difficult it is to live with migraine. We are normal people. We are not disabled people. We are normal people and we have a normal disease. I would put here an example that I, have, uh, I had in mind the other day. For instance, dyslexia. And I, I look at, my, at the neurologist here. The dyslexia is a neuro neurological condition, neurological disease. It, uh, it came out suddenly, uh, but in 10 years, those children were diag well diagnosed and they have support. They have support at the classroom, they have help, they, they, they are respected. In a classroom, there is one child with dyslexia, one with hyperactivity syndrome, and then by there is one with migraine, which is not, not even seen, who has to hide himself because he has migraine. Because, uh, and he is told that he is putting it as an excuse not to go to the examination, not to study, not to go to the, to the wherever, to the park. That's not fair. This is the 21st century, and we should have to be already well treated, as everyone else. And then, um, despite more than half of the responders reported the cost of the treatment, impacts to the finances, the 52%, they don't want to change it. They want to keep on having the last and most innovative CGRP therapy. They don't want to go back to the previous preventive treatments. Most of them didn't ask for a request uh, for a change, and only a 24% couldn't pay it finally because it really comes a big burden for the one family budget, and they, uh, they asked to be changed. I think that, um, and this is, I'm going to talk this to Dr. Uh, Johanna, it's uh, patients do not come well prepared very often. They do not fulfill those um, mm, diaries, but they are not well informed at the GP. The first visit that we do is to the GP, 
And those GPs need to inform us properly. They should have to give us a proper diary, explain us very well how to do it, and then send us to a neurologist when we are very severe. But many of them are not well prepared to go to the consultancy of the neurologist. And let me tell you about the, the, this. The, this is the same that the other one. Um, this is that the responders are willing to pay this, the new CDRP, uh, CDRP therapy, even if it is very expensive for them, and if it is uh, if they have if it's going to affect the family income. They need it. We need this new therapy, and it has been already demonstrated. We have already been uh, seen that we become much more productive, uh, less pre presentism uh, and absenteeism, and it's, uh, it's doing very well, and it's the first time that we have a real good treatment for migraine. So we must have it. We really need to, to get it. We really need more budget for our, for our CG therapy. I was delighted to hear uh, Dr. Thomas because I see that you understand the problem. I see that you see that um, there is a huge socio impact, uh, socio-economical impact. I see that you have a, a, um, you have had a new register here, and you are getting data from there, which is a big improvement. And it's not the same in all the countries in Europe. So we should have to, you should have to teach many other countries, or we should have to export this register way of uh, getting all those patients to many other countries uh, to finally be able to count the amount of people that is affect, affected and to get the real prevalence and to get the real uh, effectiveness of those new treatments. This is all. I don't want to be very long, but I want to make a call to action to you now, which is at the end of the, of the session, please stand up in front of one of those uh, roll-ups, this one or the one at the, at the gate, take a picture of yourself and post it on social media with the hashtag, I cannot say it in, in, your, in your language, but get impatient for migraine or with the with any hashtag mentioning migraine, yes, hashtag migraine you want, because we need to start talking about it as a normal disease. And it is hidden. We hide it. We patients hide that we are migraineers because we are scared of the stigma that it has around, and especially at the workplace. 10% of the population in one other study came out that had been fired because of their migraine. And this is a huge amount still. So thank you very much for listening to me. I give the. Děkujeme, Eleno. Thank you, Eleno. Now over to Riza Blažejovská, who will tell us uh, something about migraine and uh, the treatment of migraine in the context of the Czech Republic. We carried out a similar survey to that Elena had presented, but uh, it was done in the Czech Republic. That's the main difference. The data was collected in the first half of the current year. Um, the respondent pool was over 500 people. The goal was to find out who is the first diagnosing instance, uh, how long does it take for a patient to reach diagnosis, how long does it take for, from diagnosis to first treatment, and so on. Uh, so uh, this this is uh, some information about our respondent uh, sample uh, group. Who is the typical re respondent? For the most part, it's women of productive age between uh, 25 uh, to 55 age range, uh, um, mostly residing in Prague, Central Bohemia, and Moravia Silesia regions. Um, and uh, most of them, again, are working 
working either full time or part time, and uh, mostly they were uh, lower earning in uh, households or on the lower incomes. Um, for the most part, uh, they had uh, uh, medium to serious uh, uh, of migraine and they have been battling the disease for the most part of their life or at least one, uh, one third of respondents have uh, had migraines for about 20 years, one quarter of the respondents for 30 years and one fifth of the sample group have been migranic for uh, over 30 years. Um, and the respondents were recruited from uh, the network of contacts of uh, our association, Migrena Help. So, I have uh, written something down about uh, the patient journey, how the patient passes through the healthcare system. The first uh, a medical doctor, the first consultant tends to be uh, uh, either a neurologist or a GP. And before the patient uh, reaches final diagnosis, 40% of respondents had to uh, see uh, three to four uh, specialists. 10% um, had to see more than four specialists. So that's years of waiting in the uh, in the waiting room for before. You, you, you're diagnosed, like Elena said, in some countries, it's terrible. So it's either a neurologist, in a, to a lesser degree, a GP who diagnoses, and then uh, the uh, central neurologist or a specialist uh, neurologist are then in charge of the treatment. So this is how much time elapses from the diagnosis for, to until the first treatment. We see that a, a quite a high number of respondents had to wait um, many years before um, their first treatment. One quarter of respondents uh, waited from two anywhere from between two and five years, and uh, a not ins insignificant group waited for over five years. This is the drugs they were, the medication they were put on uh, while they waited. Uh, for the most part, again, uh, OTC medication or trip dates. Uh, so uh, they were at high risk of medication, overuse, headaches, and other symptoms. We can see the prophylactic treatment here, an innovative treatment, uh, which reaches them uh, in later stage of their patient journey, because the patient journey through the system is, in the case of migraine, quite uh, long. Uh, the, the treatment they are currently on, very similar across the respondent group, uh, OTC medication, triptanes, a small, amount, a small number were on a biological treatment, uh, but uh, out of the 23,000 people who are uh, suitable for innovative treatment according to various studies and surveys and information that have been shared here. Uh, so out of those 23,000, only 2 to 3 percent are actually receiving biological treatment, but obviously in the in our pool of contacts around migraine help, patients are well informed, so their proportion, uh, the proportion of uh, patients on innovative treatments is proportionately higher. It's not the same across the whole patient population. Triptanes being the most frequently indicated uh, treatment, but obviously there is a high risk of medication overuse symptoms, etc. Why? Uh, let me ask the patients why they do not, in their own view, subjective view, have access to innovative treatment. Uh, most frequently, they answered they were stigmatized, their doctors were trivializing their uh, subjective feeling that migraine or headache is not. Uh, a severe enough condition to require medical intervention. 
Um, some mentioned prices, some mentioned uh, all the centers, like about in the centers, the, the, the waiting time, the, the traveling distance to the center. Um, oh, but uh, those uh, patients who have traveled to the center over a half responded in retrospect that it is difficult to travel for them to the center or to get to the center for a consultation. So how much do you pay on average for um, auxiliary migraine treatment, OTC medication, but also things like psychotherapy, physical therapy, alternative medicine, traditional finest medicine, homeopathic medicines? Because people try everything during their many years of patient journey through the system. So they try all uh, various things, uh, and often they pose an undue strain on their on their organism. Over 20% of patients had to switch treatment for migraine because they could no longer afford what they were on previously. They were uh, asked, uh, they had to pay out of pocket or co-pay out of pocket for some types of triptane uh, uh, drugs. About one third stated that uh, migraine treatment as a, as a package, as a whole, impacts on their family finance. And if they were put on effective treatment early enough, they should not, they, they could certainly save themselves some of that cost. So those are some patient stories, uh, the, the wishes uh, the patients voiced. Most of them would like to find an effective treatment for their condition, uh, uh, be more productive at work, be more uh, integrated in the society. And those are individual patient stories. They shared with us in uh, the survey. It illustrates very poignantly uh, most of the points I communicated in my presentation. And obviously, it's best to underscore something with a story. It's the best way to remember something. So here, a, a, a woman with a chronic migraine, she's from South Moravia, uh, living with chronic headache is not uh, easy, thanks God, for biological treatment. I've been on it for only a month, but I'm already in much less pain. I wish I'd been informed earlier about my condition. A um, neurologist would tell me that I, I had headaches because I don't get enough exercise and I sit in front of the computer too much, so I thought it was all my fault. It all went too far. And um, I, uh, through overuse of analgetics, uh, I put myself into a terrible state. I was, uh, I suffered pain daily. I was just surviving. I was not living. And there was nothing I could do. I didn't have uh, money to buy innovative treatment out of pocket. Uh, and uh, so I had to, um, all I could do was to wait and hope. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Thank you for what you are doing. Uh, Josefina, uh, medium severity migraine from Prague. Uh, uh, time availability of the doctor and their approach to preventative treatment is the worst. Uh, uh, GPs do not know whether they can prescribe something uh, or they do not believe me. I've been waiting for a consultation with a neurologist for at least three months. Three, uh, and they have not been even answering calls lately, uh, answering uh, telephone. Simona, chronic migraine. I've been suffering migraine for years. Uh, last year, I've had more than 20 seizures in a month. Uh, my doctor was not understanding at all. That was the worst. And also the neurologist that told, uh, who told me that you are migraine, so get used to it. Nobody told me that there are centers for headache treatment where they could help me. And I came across migraine. I helped only by chance, and I'm on biological treatment now. Petra, chronic migraine from Prague. Uh, it's a big difference. 
In the numbers before biological treatment, when I, uh, I had cons I was in constant pain and over 20 migraine days a month, and I had to overuse analgetics and uh, complement it with physiotherapy, psychotherapy, and nutritional supplements, and it all cost me tons of money. Now I'm on biological treatment. My frequency uh, is uh, lower. The cost is not so prohibitive, and I learned about biological treatment from you, so you changed my life. And thank you very much. So this brings me to the very end of my presentation. In summary of what I uh, was trying to get across, um, our typical respondent here, a woman productive age 25 to 50, 59, 43 uh, percent responders see two, between two and three specialists before they are diagnosed with migraine. 11 percent uh, had to see more than four specialists. 24 percent of respondents are waited between two and five years for their uh, migraine treatment. 24 percent uh, wait for more than five years. The most frequent uh, treatment are uh, OTC, analgetics, and triptanes. Innovative treatment, preventative or prophylactic, is available to 20% of patients. But note, they are from patients in the contact uh, network of migraine health. But uh, the overall population, in the overall population, is between two and three percent of uh, suitable patients receive biological treatment. Innovative treatment are the most uh, said to be the most uh, difficult form of treatment to get uh, for more than over. 50% of respondents uh, could get to the center or found some difficulties in getting consultation with the center. When, when they get there, 93% saw uh, of, of those who are on innovative treatment see their health improve. 90% of respondents switched uh, migraine treatment uh, at some point during their life because of the cost, and for 34%. Uh, um, see that uh, their migraine treatment cost-wise um, impacts on their family finance. So here are some uh, statements from patients as well. Uh, uh, and the last one is biological treatment changed my life. Um, only the journey to get biological treatment seemed endless. Um, so those are recommendations um, based in our data and experience of migraine help. Uh, I hope this will uh, lead us on the way to greater availability of innovative migraine treatments in the Czech Republic. Those are the uh, general steps. Uh, broken down into individual action points, uh, describing or reflecting upon each uh, aspect of the healthcare system with a view to uh, speeding up the patient journey so that more patients get on the treatment sooner, saving costs to themselves as well as to the whole society. So, um, well-organized care, uh, lege artist treatment, political support for uh, availability of effective treatment, uh, education of uh, medical and, uh, and non-medical health care professions, uh, improving information or awareness of the patients and the public at large, and the migraine map, map of uh, care availability, so you could see uh, where the centers are, where the gaps are that need to be bridged over, where the patient population concentrates, so it, in order to be able to scale up uh, uh, the system to uh, the current need. And uh, last but not least, uh, st action steps, GPs that correctly diagnose and do not underestimate uh, the patient's uh, conditions and feelings, I'm, I'm outpatient uh, neurologist uh, to indicate relevant preventative treatment, I'm uh, outpatient neurologist to warn. Uh, uh, of the risk of triptane over and analgetic overuse uh, to 
recommend uh, or refer the patient to the center, um, the centers to be available evenly in all regions of the Czech Republic, having adequate personnel capacity, centers to have uh, sufficient budgets for the existing as well as new patients, have con to have contracts with all the health funds, health insurance funds, and uh, patients to be well informed and adherent to treatment and uh, reducing in indication criteria for biological treatment finally. Uh, thank you, Riza. I would like to ask all the panelists to come back here to the table. We've got a uh, lot of information. Uh, we re do not have to waste our time. We can start the discussion straight away. So, we have a microphone here that we need to be using for the discussion. Just raise your hands. But I have a first question for Riza. Uh, Riza, could you please describe in more detail what Migrena Help does to make the situation better in the country and what are your plans? Thank you. This is a nice question. Migrena help uh, um, uh, primary objective is to inform patients so that they know about uh, treatment possibilities, how to access the treatment. And from the very beginning of our existence, which is the end of 2018, we have been um, consulting patients concerning healthcare, um, migraine treatment. We also have uh, uh, labor counseling. We have a website with a lot of information. We're trying to build awareness through media campaigns. Uh, so it's not we're, we're not communicating only within the community of people suffering from migraines, but we're really very open and we go public. We organize events, festivals, etc. So you can you can see all the activities that we uh, have. Uh, this is this is a slide from the last year. Uh, we have more than 350 people. Our website is visited by more than 15,000 unique users, and this is a huge number every month. And we were also uh, recognized by PR Lemur, which is an award for the best healthcare campaign. So I think we've been doing a lot, really. And we're also organizing this event today that uh, uh, we organize to bring together all the stakeholders and uh, create a platform for um, uh, discussion and to improve the situation. Now, are there any more questions now? We have a question. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to ask a question about the study and apparently one of the problems is that patients do not get uh, proper information in time. So how can the Ministry of Health uh, support uh, dissemination of information and build awareness of the problem uh, um, in the society? Well, yes, of course, I believe all our panelists may contribute to the discussion now. Well, if I may start, this is not an easy question at all. Um, in terms of uh, building awareness, of course, the ministry can uh, provide um, some grants. They also have a patient portal, but they're options are really very limited. And if uh, a community works and functions as the one around uh, Migrena Help, it makes much more sense, obviously. And 
uh, if I um, um, when I observe the system, I can see that the first contact point for all the patients is their general practitioner. And this is the right thing to do in the Czech Republic. But I think there is a huge debt in there as well, because the motivation, education is lacking. Uh, so perhaps this is a question for health insurance companies if they could perhaps uh, work more with the GPs to increase the quality of care because we have other programs uh, for other diagnosis in other areas and this is not just about availability of the treatment of the medication but the entire system has to be aligned really and I may be observing availability or progress of availability of modern uh, drugs um, to treat other diagnoses. And it's usually not so much about money. It's uh, really about patients not coming from the, not being moved through the, through the system to really reach the best specialist for them. So uh, I think uh, building awareness is one thing, and then readiness of the healthcare system is another. And I think right now uh, I see a problem or lack of engagement with the GPs, really the first of contact for the patients. Well, I think this was a question for us as well, for our uh, society, what we can do uh, for patients as general practitioners practitioners and of course we organize events but only certain group of general practitioners come to our meetings those who want to get more involved who are interested in the new information so we somehow can disseminate the information among this particular group but then the question is how to get the other physicians to participate so perhaps uh, this might be a question for media as well to perhaps to roll out a campaign Pain. So you asked about the ministry. If the centers were approved and officially endorsed by the Ministry of uh, Healthcare, and luckily we don't have them because this would really be very difficult to uh, administer, then it would be possible. But right now it has to go dif differently. Um, because I would like to, to share with you one practice that, one very best practice that was done in, in Italy. We have been disseminating those data in many countries at uh, national level, and we disseminated the, the um, Italian ones in March. First thing I would say the Minister of Health is to meet this panel of experts, people here. Those experts and the patients, all together around and talk to them directly. And uh, they did, that's what they did in Italy, in, in Rome. We presented, the, we launched the study there on a Thursday, and next Monday, they called us from the Parliament of, the, of uh, Italy, and they wanted, uh, and they created a special committee for migraine. And in this committee, special for migraine, they have created also a scientific panel, advisory panel, with exactly the same experts and here, and they are trying to improve the implementation of new rules and normative for well, to improve the life of the, of the next generations. I would say that we patients, we know that this is an inherited uh, um, disease also, and we will do all our best to improve the life of our next generations. We don't want to see a next generation all chronified, or badly treated, or poorly treated, because we know how much we, we have suffered in our generation. And I would also tell him that we are not just patients. We are individuals with our careers, our studies. I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I do my, my, my own life apart. I have a big family. I have many other things to do in life. I'm the voice of the patient here. But I am an individual with all my rights like any other or, or individual in the world. So you should have to take care or he should have to take care and listen to us as um, we do with many other diseases. So thank you. If you can convince him, it, I would be so happy with you, and I would be, thank you so much. But that's what my, my, I just wanted to share this best practice in Italy, in case it helps you. Thank you, Eleanor.
Thank you, Elena. And I think we have another question here. Uh, uh, I represent the Ministry of Healthcare, and I would like to comment on building awareness and establishing cooperation. And uh, basically, there are two levels. So one level is uh, building awareness among patients. And of course, this is important. But right now, I do not really know how we could support this uh, at the ministry because we have a large uh, uh, patients' right department. Perhaps you have already established cooperation with this particular department, or you may be in touch with some of the uh, with some of the specialists from the department. And the second level is really building awareness among uh, physicians, among GPs. And of course, there's definitely room for improvement. There is no doubt about it. But if you're interested, I would like to uh, perhaps invite you to uh, uh, meet the head of our department, because you may have some inputs, and we might be able to help you. Uh, and we would really like to open the, this discussion. So this is this is my comment. Thank you, Madam Kavkova. Well, uh, yes, this could really become part of uh, the the training programs for uh, general practitioners because, of course, the, the doctors have to go through the uh, lifelong learnings. So especially the new doctors might uh, become involved more in in some um, specialized training or education. We can continue. Is there another question? Anything else that you would like to hear? Just a minute. We need to wait for the microphone. Uh, my name is Prochaskova. I am from the uh, military health company. And of course, you mentioned that uh, health insurance companies also have to be involved. And this is true. However, with the increasing number of uh, the centers, it's a little more difficult to find budgets. But uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nejadal and Dr. Markova uh, showed the maps in their presentations demonstrating or illustrating the number of centers and their personal and patient capacity. Uh, the thing is that uh, sometimes we get a request from a specialist uh, uh, who claims that they have one patient and no more information. And this is really very difficult to really award the headache center certificate to a particular specialist. So um, could, you, could you please provide me with your presentation? Uh, because it would be useful for us. Uh, the data that you present would be useful for us, really, uh, in deciding on certifying or supporting other centers or other specialists who uh, would like to engage in uh, migraine treatment. So I will leave you my card, and I would really be grateful to get your presentation with all the data. This would really be helpful. and. Uh, this this would, I, I, I could also share uh, the information with physicians because it's really about discussions between specialists, health insurance companies, the ministry. So we really need to discuss this at all levels. This is a, the great thing that you're doing. I personally know people who used to suffer from migraine and now with innovative treatment, they are really happy. I, I have three colleagues personally who, who, who uh, started using uh, the innovative treatment and they really find it to be a miracle. And uh, we know that migraine can really disqualify many people from living their lives. So I will do what I can to to really get the information or take the information from here to our uh, health insurance company. 
Thank you very much for the question. Of course, we can share any presentation, and we uh, the the uh, number of the centers hasn't changed for two years. Uh, so, if you look at the Czech Headache Society website, you will find the numbers there. And we had discussions with the Association of Healthcare or Health Insurance Companies two years ago and after that we've only been discussing the budgets individual budgets and uh uh, the problem is that our budget uh, does not really increase and uh, uh, there's a group of patients that uh, we take care of and we know that some 60 percent of patients uh, remain on the treatment but the budget does not increase at all we would like it to um, get somewhat bigger uh, so that we could get more more new patients. Of course, it would be better for us if we could accept more patients. And this is especially a problem we have with the military health insurance company. So the, the budget we have from this particular insurance company hasn't changed for a long time. So this is not about the uh, military university hospital. It's it's a different. It's a it's a it's a it's a, one of the our centers is really trying to ask for more money, and we're not able to get more money. So we cannot accept any new patients, basically. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, hear there's no signal. So after we close this formal part of the meeting, we can continue in the networking uh, during the coffee break. And um, you, can, you can talk to, to the colleagues uh, here and exchange your business cards. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any more uh, questions. And I know there are representatives of the State Truck Administration Agency. And I'm wondering if you find the information uh, that you've just learned useful, but we may have another question now. Anyone from the ministry would like to comment? Anyone from the health insurance companies? So we may have one more question here. I have one more question for representatives of the health insurance companies. Uh, we uh, discussed the availability of um, the treatment and of awareness of the treatment. So how could insurance companies support this? Because as we raise awareness of this issue and of the treatment, there will be more patients interested in the, uh, in the treatment as well. So how can health insurance companies support the treatment centers to fund more uh, stuff at the centers, etc. Anyone would like to ask this? Uh, sorry, answer. Yeah, but I would like to say that it's even the Minister of Health. Would, uh, this lady before I cannot pronounce the name, but this, uh, this lady before was talking about the how how can the Minister of Health do? How can they do to improve this situation? Well, from the patient's point of view, because we know from, from the science point of view, from the point of, uh, patient's point of view, society perception, and in general from that piece, I think you could help us to raise awareness around migraine. You need, you need to help us to take out the stigma of what a migraine is. Migraine is, we are sometimes now saying to pa patients that they, are, they have a disabled neurological condition. That's creating more stigma to them, to the patients. It's very good message because it's the truth for science, but it's very bad message for uh, the population or the policymakers because they get scared and they get hidden and they want to say, I have friends of mine that have suffered forever migraine, and now they come to me when they hear to say, me saying that this is a little a, a disabled a neurological condition, and they say to me, no, no, I don't have that, the, that thing that you say. I don't have migraine. I have another thing, but mine is not disabled. I am I'm not a disabled person. They don't want to be seen as disabled person, uh, people. 
and this is a huge stigma. And if you, if you think about it, nearly 20% of the population suffer migraine or has a type, uh, migraine type of brain, but they are not anywhere. When, uh, they, are only, they only approach you when you are in a meeting or in a wedding or in a round table or whatever, and then they start telling you, oh, myself, I suffer migraine, don't tell that to anyone. My, uh, my son, my cousin, my neighbor, all of them have a relative, have someone around with migraine. I've been talking to the minister of one minister in Spain, and she had migraine, and I knew that because she was sometimes when she was reading the papers, several in several occasions she had to ask the assistant to come and read the paper for her, and then I say I approached her and I said, "What happened to you? Do you, don't you feel well? What happened?" Said, well, don't say that to anybody. But I had an aura. I started with migraine, and I had to take a pill. But please. Don't use it, because everyone will use it against me. Because you, we have this aura, we have this situation, and migraine is seen as, as a, a disease for weak people. It seems that we are always complaining because we have headache, we are very weak people, we don't cope with the situation, and this is, for me, this is all the opposite. Migraineers, and I don't know if any one of you suffer migraine here, are superheroes. They suffer migraine hidden at, them, at their houses. It's completely invisible. The disease is completely invisible. You don't see it. When I have a migraine attack, I will be, stay at home and will leave out of my house when I feel a little bit better. My migraine attack is gone. But if, during my migraine attack, I will be completely hidden and I won't show my face or my vomiting situation or my disgusting situation to anyone. And when you um, see me, it's over. So we, you, need, you need to trust what we say, that it's so difficult to live with it. And those people who suffer migraine, they carry on their house, they study, they go to school, they, they get married, they, have, they go out with friends, they have, we have tried to have a normal life, hiding our migraine uh, disease, but living with it. We're living with this condition and we are really conditioned by it. So I think you, you could, from the Minister of Health, you can help us to raise awareness, to give the appropriate information to patients, and also to ask them to go to a physician if they feel bad, if they, feel, if they have many migraine attacks or headaches. Go to a physician. Don't self-treat it. Don't start taking all the analgesics that you have around, that everybody tells you to take, that everything, because that's the wrong way to go. Go to a good physician, good GP. If you don't like the one that has treated you, go to another one until you find the best specialist in migraine. I think that's the only way at this moment to get an appropriate treatment. Paní doktorka Marková se chtěla k tomu také vyjádřit. Uh, Dr. Marková wanted to speak, if I may, uh, on the subject of the ministry. Uh, multiple sclerosis uh, is a minist has a ministry certified network of uh, MS centers, which has a the network or the centers in the network have uh, standards for numbers of day numbers of they have to be open, how many doctors have to be working there, and so on. Um, and it is a subject to inspections. Um, so when you're certified as a center, you have to meet a certain uh, threshold. Uh, for instance, they have to have a certain number of doctors and a certain number of nurses. Uh, to uh, meet uh, the certification requirements of the ministry, so it does not need to go through the uh, through the health insurance funds, through the health insurance companies, but uh, through the ministry. If the ministry gives something, uh, some uh, some certification or something to the to the network of our, our centres, then the ministry has the power of inspection or control, and uh, there must be some standards that need to be met. And uh, this is probably the way which would force uh, uh, us to work not only one afternoon in a week, but let's at least three days a week. 
uh, in those centers. And there should it should not be arbitrary, uh, depending on which region has which capacities, but it, there should be a certain minimum expectation that will always be met. I just got an idea. There was a joint uh, project between VZP, the largest health insurance fund, and we supplied some analytical uh, work for it. So I, I, I familiarized myself with the data. The money always comes first. So when uh, the centers have uh, only limited budgets, then they cannot grow, they cannot develop. But we also looked at various regional differences in um, um, the numbers of doctors working there in, and on uh, the uh, licensing of new centers and uh, which uh, specialties are underrepresented uh, represented for instance and then then it opens up space for uh, a dialogue about which a neurologist offices or neurology clinics want to become such center and, you know, um, expand their area on business. So if it is done this way, and especially through the ministry, that would, uh, that would lead to an improved quality or standard of care in those centers, uh, more accessibility, higher availability, and uh, the health insurance fund uh, would be again guaranteed to have their coverage criteria met in neurology and headache and migraine migraine care for that region so that could be an ideal collaboration if, if you know if the centers the health funds and the ministry all all cooperate on that um, we also spoke about 20% uh, prevention of migraine. Uh, the data from 2016 uh, from the data set of the of one hand health insurance fund, the, 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 the figure was only 1%. So I would say it's somewhere between 1% and 20%. Uh, there will be a certain segment of population requiring long-term innovative therapy, meaning that the center will have to serve half a million of population, none of the existing centers are prepared for that, and uh, we have to look at it this way. What we see today is only the tip of the iceberg, uh, and most of the picture, the real picture, is hidden under the surface. Well, I'm not such an advocate for centers. Uh, um, but we are talking a different, uh, taking a different direction than Slovakia, Germany, because uh, those two countries, for, for instance, you know, certifying uh, GPs and neurologists, regular neurologists for migraine treatment, because migraine is not a disease. In all respect, like multiple sclerosis, that requires a center to be treated. Uh, because if we accredited individual doctor's offices uh, or clinics, then we would have a, a denser network, a better network than we have today. And that would be more uh, equipped to take care of the numbers of patients. And this, I'm not calling for the centers to be abolished, but the centers could then be, would, have a, would not be so overloaded with routine work. So I'm, I'm calling for kind of a hybrid model and a different uh, approach to, uh, to, to care because, uh, for instance, multiple sclerosis has uh, about 12 centers. Uh, rheumatology centers are about 50 in the country. Just for you know comparison, going back to my previous uh, question to Madam Storova, the data that you've heard today. Uh, did you find the data interesting, the data from the survey by my Migrena help? And uh, what would you do with it, with the data uh, going forward? Thank you very much. I'm happy to have listened to all the presentations. They were all very interesting. Let me approach this on two levels. One. 
uh, patient organizations. We, the State, State Institute for Drug Control, cooperate with patient organizations. We have dozens of um, memoranda uh, signed with them. And once a year, we uh, hold uh, a grand patient organization open day at our institute. We invite them all, all the patient organizations. We uh, probe with them beforehand what they want to discuss, what issues they want to put on the table, etc. Then we, you know, based on that, we prepare two or three presentations, and then there is a big Q and A part. And and the second level, the more difficult one to to approach is uh, medication drugs. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, that's now available in the Czech Republic, this kind of treatment, I'm very happy about that. Um, any new information, all new research or data, please forward them to us. If I'm not mistaken, um, for the migraine treatment, um, and the monoclonal uh, antibody treatment of those, uh, we uh, we are un, uh, doing um, an in-depth review to amend the indication criteria. Uh, so that's in progress, and all the clinical pharmacological studies and data will be collected in one place. I hope to have enough evidence to um, to do something, to, to make changes to the present set of criteria. Well, obviously, I cannot promise anything. I can only express my personal hope. But uh, if I, if when we get a request uh, for additional data to be included in this review, we're happy to accommodate that. Thank you very much. Anybody from the audience, perhaps? Or? Oh, Elena? Prosím od samého začátku, apeluji na to, aby byl hlas pacientů zapojen do všech debat, diskuzí. Přizívejte pacientské organizace, aby byl zastoupen hlas pacientů, protože my často jako pacienti víme, co chceme. Jde o to mít, kde to říct. Často někdo se zaměří na ten vedlejší příznak, ten vedlejší, jiný vedlejší příznak, ale my skutečně máme z pozice pacientů hodně k tomu, co říct. Takže skutečně apeluji, aby ten hlas pacientů byl od samého začátku při di di diskuzích o nových terapiích, inovativních léčbách a podobně. Tak nevím, to je v do detailu porozuměla té otázce, ale uh, pokud se týká zapojení vlastně pacientských organizací... Well, uh, as far as uh, involvement of patient organization into our processes is concerned, in the Czech Republic we have a new law which makes patient organization uh, a mandatory party for uh, our new treatment procedures and new drug procedures uh, according to Code of Administrative Procedure. But even in instances when which are exempt from this process, i.e. patient organizations would not need to be included mandatorily, we still solicit their opinion, we approach them and, and discuss with them. Thank you very much. The last chance to ask a question or comment on something. If not, thank you very much. We will uh, send a summary of today's seminar to your email uh, addresses. 
diskutovat dál neformálně. In, in a matter, uh, it will be a matter of, of, of a few days, so please bear patience. Uh, so with that, I conclude the formal part of this seminar. Let's gather over the courtyard in the other room over tea, coffee, and uh, for some tea and coffee and discuss further. Thank you very much.